In this presentation, we're going to be examining information theory. This is a very broad theory that had its roots in the work of Shannon and Weaver, as we discussed in a previous lecture. And I think that you'll find uh, they, there's some actual relevance here that you can use in your own life on a day-to-day -day basis. There are some key concepts associated with this particular theory. Information, entropy, peace, bit, turbulence, information load, and uncertainty reduction. And we'll be looking at those as we go along. Information may be defined in this context of this theory as that which, in, as that which reduces uncertainty. It involves data, process, channel, outcomes, uses. But the more information we have about something, uh, the more certainty we have about the nature of that event. Of course, there are sometimes when humans use information to generate uncertainty, but the way this theory works and the way we're using it in this context, uh, information refers to the notion of those questions, those answers, those pieces of information that actually reduce the uncertainty in a situation. In any situation, there is a degree of entropy, and entropy refers to chaos, randomness, turbulence, the degree of uncertainty. Uh, for example, you have an exam coming up in a few weeks in this course, and there's a great deal of entropy, I assume, for most of you. If you're repeating the class for some reason, then uh, there's less entropy than there may be for your classmates. Or if you've studied very well and, and you have a good sense of what you believe will be on the exam, then you have less entropy. But in most situations, there is at least some degree and sometimes a, a large degree of chaos or randomness which uh, results in turbulence and uncertainty. And so this theory looks at how we work to reduce that entropy by acquiring information. Obviously if you had a, a copy of the exam beforehand and all you had to do was study the copy of the exam that would uh, reduce your uncertainty a great deal. Uh, but we're not going there today. The concept piece refers to a single unit of information. Like in a deck of playing cards, there are, not counting the jokers, there are 52 pieces of information. 13 suits times, uh, pardon me, 4 suits times 13 cards to a suit gives you 52 pieces of information. So if you, were, if you pull a card out of the deck and, and somebody's trying to guess what that is, uh, it, it was, unless you know how to acquire the information through bits, which we will come to shortly, uh, you, there are 52 pieces of information and you might be guessing for a long time before you guess what the playing card is. But if you have bits of information, by definition, a bit is a unit of information that reduces the alternatives by half, a decision between two alternatives, a binary decision either this or that. And this is fundamental to a lot of the computer programming that takes place, but we're not going there today. But as you see the young lady in the uh, graphic on this slide, she has two choices, green or purple, and uh, when she makes one, that reduces the alternatives by half, and in this case, settles the issue for her. In the deck of cards, though, there are bits of information that can reduce the alternatives by half and get the individual to a decision uh, to the needed piece of information, i.e. which card are you trying to identify, in far fewer questions. It takes five or six questions to actually do that, and we'll see that shortly. Okay, on the next slide, a card is going to appear from a standard deck of playing cards. How many pieces of information are there? 
how many bits are required to identify the card, and formulate your own yes or no questions, and then take a look at what more closely what you're already seeing on this slide. But if, if you pull a, a card out of the deck, a five of spades, a four of hearts, a, a nine of clubs, whatever, uh, you could guess 51 times and get all no answers if you had really bad luck. But if you know how to formulate bits or, or cut your alternatives in half, then you can ask questions like the ones that you see on the screen now and answer and resolve determine, that's the word I want, determine what that card is in five or six questions. If you get all yes answers, you can do it in five. If you pick up a no somewhere along the way, uh, then it takes six questions to get there. And we'll see how that works. So on the next slide, is the card black? No, so therefore it must be red. But don't ask a question like, is it a club? Because if the answer is no, you still have three other suits to choose from, and it takes additional questions. So be sure that the answers you're formulating are actually questions that cut the alternatives in half. Is the card that you're about to see a diamond? The answer is yes. Is that card greater than seven? The answer is yes. Is the card greater than ten? Yes. Well, if it's greater than 10, it must be the jack, queen, or king. Uh, we're putting the ace down by the one, two, three. I should have told you that in the beginning. But anyway, is it the king? No. So therefore, it has to be either the jack or the queen. Is it the queen? Yes. Review those questions. Think about them. And then look at the next slide. There it is, the queen of diamonds. Now, try it again before going on to the next slide, or get your own deck of cards and try it. What do you predict will be the card on the next slide? And while you're thinking about your questions, or you may have to back up and look at the ones I provided for you, but see if you can do it yourself. Also, think about what relevance all of this has to do with our daily communication messages, and in particular, does it have anything to do with the exams in this class? And we'll answer that question a little later on. So ask your questions, think about what you believe the card will be on the next slide. Did you do it in five questions, or did it take six questions? And you won't know until you see the answer, of course. And the answer is the king of spades. Did you accurately predict it? If so, how many questions did it take for you to do so? Now, what does this have to do with this course or with exams in this course. Well, for example, if you ask me for bits of information about the exam, I'm more likely to answer them than I am if you ask me for pieces. If you say, do we have to know the word bit on the test? Do we have to know the word entropy? What about the word chaos? Uh, do we have to be able to define encoding, decoding, verbal, nonverbal, theory, concept, on and on and on. Those are all pieces of information. But if you say to me, is our exam essay? That's a yes or no question. And in this case, the answer is no. So you know that it's some sort of objective format. If you say, uh, will we be filling in the blanks with concept names that we've learned this far in the semester? For most of you taking this online class, the answer is no. If you are taking the test at the Electronic Testing Center, here's your bit of information. All of the tests at the Electronic Testing Center or the Academic Testing Center, I think you are scheduled for Academic Testing Center, all of those exams are multiple choice. So that immediately eliminates a number of other alternatives. Now these aren't specifically perfectly binary decisions, but you can understand how the answer to the question gives you a large bit of information, a big chunk of information, and eliminates a lot of other things. And to continue the, that last thought about the exams, 
if you are taking makeup exams or if you are being tested out of state or at a remote testing center somewhere, uh, you do not have a multiple choice exam, at least as the course exists today. Uh, those are not available. So uh, you, the answer for you is slightly different. You will be taking objective exams, not essay exams, uh, but they will not be multiple choice. But everybody testing on campus, it will be multiple choice. So there's your bit of information for the moment. Okay, just to review quickly some of the definitions that we have. Turbulence refers to the degree of stability or instability in the environment, and that affects the amount of entropy in the situation, much like a hurricane. The more turbulence there is, the more entropy, the more uncertainty there is. Information load refers to the quantity of information that's combined with relative difficulty in transmission. Uh, we understand that in organizational settings, particularly uh, when people burn out either because of underload or overload. And we'll see this, con this concept coming up again uh, much later in the semester when we look at organizational communication theory. Some people quit their jobs because they are so overloaded they are just stressed out to the max and just can't take it anymore, can't handle that bombardment of information. But there are also people who quit their jobs because of underload. They are so bored with nothing to do that they just can't take it anymore. And so the load is too small, they're bored, and they quit. Uh, I knew someone who was a monitor for a fax machine. And all day long her job was to uh, pick up whatever faxes came in and deliver them to the appropriate office. And sometimes that was very exciting if a 50-page fax came in from Tokyo and was marked urgent. Uh, that was quite exciting. But then four or five hours might go by before another fax came in and there was nothing to do. She had no desk and wasn't supposed to read a book on the job. She just kind of had to entertain herself. And so she lasted about two days on that job and moved on to something else. That was underload. So we seek information in order to reduce uncertainty. Uh, because we're human and we're very creative and uh, so on, we often, uh, not often, but there are times that we create uncertainty by the information that we transmit. Uh, I create a certain amount of uncertainty about your exams in here because I want you to study more material, learn more material that I'm actually able to test you on. So I don't tell you exactly what the questions will be on the test, uh, as has been the tradition over time for a long time. Professors uh, talk about and hopefully teach a whole lot more than they actually test on. Social cognition theory takes what we've just been talking about in information theory and uses that to explain how people reduce uncertainty by increasing their knowledge of social situations. How do we come to learn and know the things that we do? How do you know what to do in a particular social situation? How do you know what to do when you go on a job interview? Uh, if you're going to meet your future in-laws, uh, what, what should you do? What should you say? What should you not say? How should you behave? Uh, so social cognition theory we'll see more of when we get to the interpersonal unit. Uh, but it helps us learn and, and discover the knowledge that we believe we need in social situations. And we do that through our own experiences, through the experiences of other people, uh, through identifying role models that are folks that we would like to be like, uh, and role playing. Sometimes parents and teens reverse roles and do a little role playing to help understand the other person's point of view. So direct experience, indirect experience, role playing, and modeling are the four primary ways according to social cognition theory. And uh, that's the work of Albert Bandura, and we'll see that again later on.